everyone. We're recording the meeting for posterity. <laughs> um, a lot of people have, are usually in touch to say that they want to see it and um, yeah, and, and can't always make the time. So we try to record for them. Um, so uh, we're so happy today to have um, both uh, Jane Six Smith from our own training team here at Soil Association and uh, Rachel and others from uh, Groundwork South Wales um, to talk about um, preserves. Um, we're gonna have an hour for the session. So just some quick housekeeping. Um, Again, we can't do full introductions, but hope you use the chat um, just to give your name where you're based or the organization group you're with. Uh, and then, yeah, anything you want to share about dams and preserves would be lovely, your favorite one or something like that. Um, we're going to hear from the members of the panel and there'll be time for Q&A. Um, and as I say, we're recording this session. Uh, so I'm Andrea Gibbons. I'm the network coordinator for Food for Life Get Togethers. And basically we're a simple program that's all about bringing people together through how we grow, access, cook and share food. And we're really excited to have this program today because it's um, sort of cook and share month. So it's kind of a month where we have a campaign really trying to encourage people to come together as a community and cook and share food together. And I think everyone here is probably well aware of how brilliantly food brings people together um, and just creates these lovely warm spaces um, where we can get to know each other and um, nourish ourselves. And I think that's gonna be particularly important in the, the winter that's coming. I think we're all pretty worried about that. Um, so yeah, cook and share, we're very excited about that. And um, we'll have a little bit more about that. Um, and um, we're part of this, um, we're part of the Soil Association, um, which is really um, kind of connects this, the, our particular focus on community with this broader focus on land, regenerative forestry, farming, how we grow food. Um, so it's kind of a holistic model working step-by-step step to do what we can to tackle climate change from the ground up. Um, so I think uh, to get started, I will, I don't have the running order in front of me because <laughs> too many windows. It's Jane first. That's what I thought. I'm going to get it up while you're speaking, but I'm going to introduce Jane Sixsmith um, from our training team and um, kick us off here. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, Beth's going to do the, the slides for me, so uh, and I'll talk over those. But yeah, I'm Jane Sixsmith. I'm um, I was a, a, a food teacher in secondary school um, and for quite a while now I've been a, a, a trainer around uh, cooking skills, uh, mostly training teachers and community leaders to, to run cooking activities with children and, and adults. So yeah, been all over the country, all over the UK, um, working with lots of groups. So yeah, so that's, that's me. And personally, I'm a mad preserver. Um, I think it's it's come from um, my family background, um, something we've always done. Uh, I can remember my grandma salting, not very healthy these days, but salting green beans um, and having jars of those in, in her pantry. But um, yeah, so I, I do lots of preserving. So this was a, a nice thing for me to join in with. So yeah, do you want to take me through there? Next one, please. So yeah, I was asked the question, um, you know, why why do we want to preserve? It, it it might be seen as a bit of an old fashioned thing to do and quite time intensive, um, but there's lots of reasons. Not least that it is enjoyable, you know, taking something that might be thrown away that is surplus uh, and turning it into something fantastic. But um, so I've, I've sort of listed just a few ideas about why we should preserve uh, under the three P's of people, place and planet. So, I mean, traditionally, um, we, we preserve to, to help us through the, the lean times. Um, and it's still, you know, that, that's still, I suppose, valid in that you're not going to be growing tomatoes yourself in the in the winter. So it might be quite nice to have your own some dried tomatoes that you've put in oil in jars and to remind you of the sunny days. But um, but I'd say these two are perhaps the, the key ones that it adds variety to our diets. Um, you know, being able to add a, a pickle, it's quite trendy as well now, add a pickle to your burger or something, but a pickle that you've made is fantastic. Um, and it can be cheaper than buying from a supermarket. It can be really expensive if you, you know, were buying fruit and vegetables out of season to preserve but if you can get hold of them for other from you know other growers or from your own garden um, then definitely it's cheaper um, and it's a great way to connect with family with neighbors um, you know sharing produce 
I, um, my neighbour next door has got a crab apple tree, well, sort of in a hedgerow. And uh, I, I was away last week and she, she, just before I went away, she gave me a great big bag of crab apples, which were sitting in my fridge. And then last night I looked, I thought, oh my goodness. So anyway, overnight, I, I cooked them and dripped them overnight. And then this morning got up early and that's what, you can, oh, you won't be able to see later on. You can see behind me, I've got um, some jars of crab apple and chili uh, jelly, but yeah, a great way. And then I lent her my, one of my favorite recipe books for preserving. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great way of connecting with people. And then, you know, it's, it's good for, you know, keeping food local either grown yourself um you know or grown in a local allotment um you know and and that those those food miles become tiny you know i've grown it i've preserved it i've shared it with my neighbors and i've put it on my toast and eaten it um i live in the peak district so bilberries i don't know if you know what those are but they're like tiny little blueberries a devil to pick um but they're on the hills just where you know just up just up from here and, you know, there's very few places that you can actually pick bilberries. So really nice if, if you were, I don't know, giving a Christmas gift to give some bilberry jelly or something like that. But, you know, if you're in Scotland, that's the, the home of soft fruit, raspberries, you know, fabulous raspberry jam from Scotland would be a real treat. Um, and then, you know, for, for the planet, then, you know, it uses up lots of fruit and veg that many people you know, could throw away. I, you might have seen lots of trees this year full of apples um, and, you know, we're importing apples. I mean, you just think, gosh, why can't we join things up and reduce our imports and use up what we've got? But that's a, another discussion, I think. And then, I mean, I certainly save my glass jars and reuse them, um, which I suppose delays that whole recycling process where you're going to use energy to re you know, reuse the glass or it stops them going to landfill. So that's that's my reasons and there's lots more. Do you want to go on to the next bit, please, Beth? Ah, so here's, <laughs> I had some crab apples last month as well. Um, and this just sort of shows you, yeah, so I decided to make crab apple and chili jelly just to give it a little bit of a, a hit. Um, yeah, from the garden, from the hedgerow, into my kitchen and now it's in my store cupboard and I actually had some of that for, for breakfast this morning on toast but it's also nice you know as a condiment to serve with meat or cheese or something like that um, but yeah you get so much satisfaction from it as well and I think I've got some top tips next that's it so if you if you're thinking of doing some preserving just just go for it you can do loads of research and it can sound a bit scary but I, I just I, I would start quite easy with a simple chutney is dead easy. Or you might you might just want to pickle some shallots, some onions, um, red cabbage, something like that. Really easy. But it's a good idea to, to perhaps do just a little bit of research so you understand how sugar, vinegar and salt can be used as preservatives. Because um, basically you want to get to a point with whatever it is you're preserving where the bacteria molds and yeast just can't survive so either by increasing the sugar content and reducing water putting an acid the vinegar or the salt uh, onto food you also it might be a good idea to work out to find out about pectin uh, and how that affects setting of jams and jellies um, and i know in the video that you're going to see in a minute there'll be some information about that um, and also it, it's perhaps find out about how um, to test for, for jam setting. Um, I mean, I do have a, a, a jam thermometer, but you know, you have to pay out for one of those. My favorite is the wrinkle test where you put a little bit of jam on a cold plate and press it. And if it wrinkles, then it's ready to set. So yeah, find out about things like that. Um, and I would also suggest you, you start with a recipe, you know, find a recipe from a trusted source or, you know, somebody who is confident at making preserves <clears throat> and then you can you can just experiment as you get more confidence um i i did a really lovely jam which i'll show you later on the other day which was an apple jam and 
I hadn't got quite enough sugar, but I'd got some brown sugar and I thought, ooh, I'm going to have a go with a bit of that. Oh, and it was fantastic. Um, and it gave that sort of caramelly taste to it. But I wouldn't have done that to start with. It was just that I thought, yeah, that's going to work just as well. Um, <laughs> and always have safety in mind, particularly if you're doing this as a community activity. Um, firstly, you need to make sure that what you produce, you know, you've destroyed or you're delaying the bacteria and mold growth through the, um, the correct methods you're using, that you use clean equipment. That goes without saying, because you're going to put these things in cupboards for up to a year. So make sure it's, you know, spotlessly um, clean and sterilised. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and just be really careful. Um, the boiling point of jam, when you get to setting point, is 105 degrees Celsius. It's also really sticky. So any splashes of hot jam can stick to your skin and burn quite deeply. So just be really careful with that. I have a really long um, preserving wooden spoon um, that if I do need to, to get my spoon in the pan, that's what I use. So yeah, that's just a few top tips. I don't think there's anything more at this stage, is there, um, Beth? I think that's it for now, and then I'll do a bit later on. That sounds great. Uh, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, so we just want to give you yeah, like a bit of context, a bit some some safety tips. Uh, but now we're going to head right into the actual um, preservation stuff with Rachel. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, if you want to introduce the video, and then I will. Play. Oh, this sounds really bad. Right, is that better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you want me to just play the video? Shall I just play the video? Okay. Okay. Um, I will. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel and I run the Roots to Life project um, as part of Groundwork Wales. Today we're going to be making some jam and chutneys with two of our lead volunteers, Leslie and Steve. Leslie and Steve have been coming to the project for quite some time now and apart from being very knowledgeable in horticulture and gardening, they often make jams and chutneys so you know they've got um, quite a lot of knowledge in doing so. The reason we're doing this today, I think like most people, at the end of every season, most growers have tomatoes left, some produce where the plants are starting to die off. Rather than dispose of them, we would just like to show you different ways of preserving it, especially with the, the cost of living as it is at the moment. Everyone can preserve food and keep it for later months. I really hope you enjoy the workshop and learn a lot from it. Leslie Jones and I've been asked to show you how to make raspberry jam. Now raspberries they're one of the soft fruits that have a very low in pectin so when we actually make the jam we soak the fruit with the sugar before you start to boil it. You can do that for a few hours or you can do what I did last night soak it overnight so that when you get up in the morning, it's all ready to process. The sugar I buy is jam sugar with added pectin. Now the pectin allows the fruit to set. If you don't have pectin, you can't have jam because the jam or the fruit mixture won't go solid. As I said last night, I soaked the sugar and the fruit together. All the pectin is being drawn out of the fruit and it's now ready to put onto the hob and to bring slowly to the boil. We have to bring it slowly to the boil because the sugar has to dissolve totally 
inside the preserving pan before you start to boil the mixture. If you don't do that, the sugar will stick to the bottom of the preserving pan and you'll have disaster. Before we actually put the preserving pan on the hob and start to make the jam, we want to ensure that we've got jam jars ready to ladle it into afterwards. Now I use jam jars with a screw top lid. The jars have to be placed, washed first, dried, and then placed in an oven at a very low temperature, about 100 fan, 120 Celsius. That will ensure that the jars are sterilized. If you do that for about 20 minutes, that should be enough. But if you don't do that, you might risk the chance that the jam, if it goes into the jars, won't become airtight and also it won't keep as long. Once you put your mixture into the jam jar and you put your lid on top, the heat then will trap and it, all, the, all the heat will be trapped inside and it alleviates any risk of air getting in, which would cause mould. So now we're ready to start to make the jam. So we put the preserving pan onto your hob, have the heat down to something like half heat, say five, because that will allow the sugar then to start to dissolve in the preserving pan. As I said, you don't want to run the risk of the sugar coating the bottom of the pan and burning, which it can do quite easily. So keep on stirring. This could take but a minute, two minutes, stirring all the time until you notice that there is no sugar. You can't feel any grittiness at the bottom of the pan. And you also notice that when you look at your spoon, there's no sugar showing on the spoon. At that stage, you can increase the heat. All this is variable according to your own hob, but I put mine on high. I bring it to the boil and you will notice that it comes, starts to come up the pan. You've got to keep stirring all the time to ensure that it doesn't come over the top of the pan. If you think the heat is too intense, turn it down slightly. You'll notice after about three minutes, the jam is starting to thicken and you get what we call a rolling boil. And that's when the boil actually isn't so much bubbling up over the top, but is actually rolling within the pan. At that stage, if you wait for, keep stirring, but take another three minutes. And at that stage, check your temperature. Now, I have a jam thermometer, which is very straightforward. It has marked for jam. So when it's boiling, all you have to do is insert the jam thermometer and wait to see where the mercury goes. If the mercury is below the level of the jam, you have to continue to boil. If it's just reached the level of the jam, you can afford then to turn the oven off, remove the pan from the heat, and at that stage, you add a knob of butter, and that will stop any scum that has come onto the top of the jam that will clear that scum and then you leave the jam as all fruit jams you leave it for about 10 minutes and during that time you can get your jam jars out your ladle your jug that you're going to pour through and the funnel that you're going to use over the top of the jam jar like that then you pour in your jam until it reaches just level to the top of the jam jar. Once your jam jars are full, you apply your lid tightly. You ensure if you've got any jam around the sides that you wipe it away and then you let it set. As with all good cooking programs, here are some that we've prepared earlier. Once the jam is in the jar and it's cooled down, you obviously want to put your label on to identify what it is, but always ensure that when you do label your jam, your jellies or your chutneys, you always put the date that you made it on the label. I knew a lady who actually, an elderly lady from the Forest of Dean who actually taught me how to make jam. 
and we started off with raspberry jam and we moved on to marmalade and since then any time I find fruit like cake gooseberries or something like that I'll try to use a recipe and try to make my own jam from it. I hope you do the same thing and I hope you've enjoyed this. be making green tomato chutney which involves the green tomatoes, onions, apples, chilies and some root ginger. So I'll begin by chopping the tomatoes. Sorry everyone, it looks like Andrea who was um, sharing the video has just dropped out of the internet connection so um, we'll try, hopefully she can rejoin again soon and then restart that second video for us. Um, you know, Jane, did you want to do the second part of your presentation now and then we can go back to the, the video when Andrea rejoins? Yeah, I was just going to say that. I'm happy sure. to do now. Yeah. Okay, great. What I'll do is I'll share your, your slides from where we got to last time and then when yeah. Andrea sits back in, we can then um, do the video afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that, no, that's fine. And it was a good place for it to break. <laughs> Ah, I didn't, I can see I didn't do all my top tips before I should have done this one before, but anyway. Um, so yeah, um, a few more top tips then. So to make preserves with seasonal fruit and veg, because that, you know, if it's freely available, that's really helpful, um, especially from allotments or your own garden. Um, and actually when it's seasonal, it'll still be cheaper to buy in the local markets or green grocers. Um, don't use damaged or overripe fruit for making jam um, because the pectin might have leached out of uh, the cell structure of the fruit and so it, it probably won't set. It isn't such a problem for chutney um, because that, that doesn't rely on pectin to make it set. Um, seal your jars correctly, we've just seen that in the video, um, and label what's in them with the date and it's make sure when you store them in that in a cool dark cupboard um, you use up the oldest first and, you know, you rotate, ro rotate the stock. But most, if, if they've got the full amount of sugar in a jam, you can get reduced sugar jams. Uh, but if it's got the full amount of sugar in or it's a, 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 a long life chutney, then they can be stored for about 12 months and you don't have to put them in the fridge. Once they're opened, I suggest you put them in the fridge if you're not going to eat them really quickly. Do you want me to carry on with the next bit or are we ready to show the second part of? Um, yeah, God, I came to the office, so I wouldn't have internet problems. <laughs> That's fine. I'll go on. I'll go on to the uh, bit that no, I would but, have done after. Uh, well, I can show, I can show the second half of the video now. Oh, if that's, yeah, do that. Um, yeah, so shall we, that. shall we just start with the um, green chili? Is that where it cut off basically? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. God, it's like all my days. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share. Right, 
Okay, so today I'll be making green tomato chutney, which involves the green tomatoes, onions, apples, chilies, and some root ginger. So I'll begin by chopping the tomatoes. Uh, cut them in half, all right. And you want reasonably small pieces, everything you need for that. Switch the scales on, get those in. Measure those, there we go. Right, and next after chopping the tomatoes, I'll be chopping the onion, removing the skin first. And then just chop this into small pieces. The tomatoes, the onion, and everything else has actually been grown on our groundworks growing project site. And that's the sort of size you want. The onion there. That can go straight in the pot. Right, so I will now add the tomatoes to the onions in the pot. And we'll now core and peel some apples. So let's put those on. So first of all, put the core through the middle. Let's remove the pips. I think these two should be enough. And also, once you've peeled it, if there are any small bruises like that, remove them because otherwise the chutney may go off quite quickly if you don't. So, And then we add those to the pot with the onion and green tomatoes. So next, chop two chilies. And if you want, if you want a spicy chutney, then keep the seeds in. If you don't want it quite so hot, you can always remove the seeds, but I leave them in. So, so that's all the chili you'll need for that. And into the pot with that. Next thing will be the root ginger. So you only need a small piece of this. So I would cut there. So that's about all you need. Cut the ends off like that. And then you can peel it. And if you're some people actually use a teaspoon for this. I've never quite perfected that, so I still use a peeler, but. And then we This bit just. And then we add those to the pot. And we've got two more things to go in. One of which is light brown sugar, you need 250 grams of the sugar. So I'll just measure that out. And the last ingredient to go in is 200 milliliters of cider vinegar or any light colored vinegar. Straight on top of the rest of the ingredients. Now put the chutney onto heat. So first of all, what you do is you put it on a high heat to get the vinegar to melt in with the sugar so you've got a sweet liquid and then when it does start to boil you turn the temperature right down low and you leave it to simmer for about an hour if you if you like a crunchier sort of texture then you can cook it for say 40 minutes or so but it won't last so long in the jars once the chutney is cooked to the consistency you want it you then put them into whatever containers you're going to use. You can use normal sort of jam jars, whatever is available. These jars, kilner jars, they have a rubber ring around. So what you do is you remove the rubber ring and you put them in the oven at about 100 degrees Celsius um, for about sort of 20 minutes, half an hour. That's to sterilize them. And while they're still hot, you then add the chutney into the jars because this is going to take about another hour to cook, just to show you, this is, these are ones I made a week ago. That's what it looks like. So that's how to make your green tomato chutney. I hope you have great success and fun making it and enjoy it with maybe some cheese or ham or whatever you'd like to have your pickles with. Thank you. those videos so much thank you so much um so those will be available on the website uh, along with the recipes um so we were just gonna have um sort of to wrap up this bit before we get into the question answer just a little bit more about sort of 
seasonal gluts. Um, but actually, I don't know if you wanted to say a bit about um, Rachel kind of the making of the video or anything like that, or we could just go straight into um, seasonal gluts and kind of additional recipes. Because we've only sort of given you a handful of things here, but um, yeah, so between you and Jane, if you. Yeah, brilliant. Um, well, as most of you know now, I'm Rachel, and I run the Roots to Life um, project as part of Bramworth Wales. Um, it's a horticultural wellbeing site, um, which we rely on volunteers to come along and learn all about, you know, growing. Um, but lesbians are great volunteers, and they not only are amazing gardeners, they're amazing cooks as well <laughs> so um we thought especially with the cost of living and you know the, the crisis you know regarding energy prices and everything else going up we thought that maybe it'd be a good time to sort of teach a lot of the volunteers how to preserve food as well so you know that can keep the coming months when money's a lot tighter for a lot of people so um yeah so we're looking at doing more and more on that now. Not all Sorry? Oh, we just lost you for a second. You froze, but I think oh. you're back. So it's all fine. No worries. Just right at the tail end there. Okay. Um, next week as well, we, we, we started making winter sweet potatoes. Everything we use is grown at our project. Um, so next week, we started to make vegetable soup, um, you know, and, and lots of different things. So at least the volunteers coming up to us have something warm to eat. They're learning, not just about the growing of the food, but the cooking of the food as well. And hopefully they can take some home as well. So, you know, that's our, apart from growing, that's our aim for the foreseeable future now to provide as many people as we can with healthy food and warm food. That's good. Yeah, I think that's going to be more and more. I think groups around the country are doing this, aren't they? Sort of expanding food production and yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, Jane. I think you had a few more slides for us about some of the sort of the other additional sort of seasonal gluts you can get and what you can make, uh, and then we'll come into a Q and A. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so these are just some photographs I've taken throughout the year um, around sort of apples, and uh, I had quite a lot of courgettes as well this year. But apples were just fantastic. Um, and you know more than ever I've had and, and and I had a problem with in the in the past I've had a problem where the apples have had like scab on them and they've not kept as well but this year they were just fantastic I've got a tree that's like grafted with three varieties and um, they're all eaters but they also work well in cooking and they cook down um so yeah that's just a little picture of my tree in top left um, when they were they were still growing, perhaps early September, um, and then I, I started picking them, probably a bit early to be honest. But I started taking the bigger ones off to to let the smaller ones come on, and also because I knew I wouldn't be able to manage preserving them all at once. Um, and so I did quite a lot of different things with them. So um, in that third picture, you can see I was just wiping them off, and then I've got quite a lot stored. I've got a big like big fridge with a big crisper drawer so that is full uh, of, of one variety of apple and I just put in between it like some what do you call that poppy all oh, that stuff you use for paper for parcels can't think of the name of it bubble wrap <laughs> um, so I just put like a layer of bubble wrap in between the apples just to cushion them and I made sure I didn't put any apples in there that had got any um any sort of blemishes because they, they would start to uh, affect the others so that that's I've got loads in the fridge and then the picture top right I've also put some in cold storage and I've wrapped them all in little pieces of um, kitchen paper um, and I, I've, I've got an old chest of drawers so I took a cupboard out of that and I've, I've put a, a single layer of apples in that and then a newspaper on the top and just put it in a, a cool um, outbuilding so I'm hoping that they'll they'll keep quite well like that 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 is a, a typical way that the apples would have been stored um, I've made quite a lot of apple puree uh, which is bottom left I've got some like silicon little silicon um, bun mold things um, so I've frozen it 
in those and then I can pop them out like a big ice cube and just put them into um, plastic bags but they're really for my grandson um, because they're eating apples but they cook down really nicely I don't have to add any sugar so they're great as a weaning food um, you know for, for, for youngsters then the next one is the, the picture of my uh, the Victorian apple jam the same which I used a little bit of brown sugar in and honestly it's divine much nicer than I imagined and I think in that I grated the apples and then made it into jam but as I say we were on holiday last week I took a jar of that we were in Cornwall and had a cream tea with it and it was delicious um I've still got some left so I put a a, a crate outside asking people to take them and yet yeah, they all went and I thought I'd find them all littered on the road where you know some kids had chucked them but they didn't so hopefully um you know they they were eaten or taken home to cook with uh and then the last picture is um apple jam I'll I'll write that recipe up yeah it, it I'll, I'll show you the book that it came from as well perhaps when we've we've stopped this um yeah the last picture is just all my peelings going into the compost bin um so that hot that idea of that full circle um that you know, means that then I can put the compost back in the ground next year to, to grow my courgettes or whatever. Do you want to do the next slide for me, please, Bear? And then I also uh, made apple cakes, really nice recipe I found. I just went online and found a nice recipe for a French apple cake, got a touch of Calvados in that, so that was a, a bit boozy, but delicious. Um, found a recipe for a, an apple and rosemary bread that was baked in um, like a big crock pot, baked in the oven, so it gave you that really nice crusty uh, finish. Beth, do you want to just show that middle bit for us, please? And I also picked this gadget up from, uh, I think it was from a charity shop, but you can you can buy them new. But just having that on the side. Um, means that we ate so many more apples because it cores it and peels it all in one go. I should have shown how, yeah, it makes into a nice big spiral with no core in there. But that was also useful when I was just preparing everything for cooking. Uh, do you want to move on, please? And then some, yeah, some other things that I've made. So I've got a really um, lovely recipe for a courgette and fennel marmalade that has, um, I grow like bronze fennel in the, the flower bed and, and you put like the little seed heads in with grated courgettes. It's got quite a lot, lot of lemon in there, but honestly, you wouldn't know that it wasn't a proper marmalade, really fantastic. Um, I made marrow, stroke courgette, chutney. Um, and again, that's where I sort of go off piece a little bit and think about what flavors I might like and, like putting some star anise instead of a spice that it tells you. Um, and then uh, an, another friend gave me loads of pears from her garden. Um, and so I pickled them. Um, so it's in like a, a sugary vinegar. And I put some pink peppercorns in with that. Um, so it gives it just a slight warmth as well. But they're saved for Christmas. I thought they'd be really nice with them. Um, a nice big ham or something like that uh, in a sandwich or just with a cheese board. So I think that's it. But yeah, just just go for it and be creative, I'd say. Oh, amazing. All right. So now's your chance. We've got about 15 minutes left. And um, so we wanted to leave some time for questions and um, yeah, questions for anyone. Uh, and we'd also love to hear if you want to put in the chat or stuff, stuff that you've made that you really loved or anything like that but yeah I think and um, I think there was just the one question in the chat really about the wax paper which we've got an answer to so I think that's yeah is there any other reasons to use wax paper you don't need it at all if you have a lid do you you don't um I just made this was what I made overnight to say it's just setting up labels it up yet but I did put a wax thing underneath this just like double sure that you know, no bacteria, nothing can get in there. But once you've got your lid on, you don't really need it. But you used to not be able to get the lids. So you used to have to put your wax disc directly on the surface of the jam. And then you had like a cellophane, uh, a circle of cellophane that you dip in water to make it a bit flexible. 
water side up, put over the top of the jar, stretch it and put an elastic band around it. So that you very definitely do need some, um, the wax discs as well. Right, any other questions from the, any other questions, comments? Oh, Mary Berry has a lovely apple cake, it says there, so that's a good one to go mm. for. Oh, yeah, we've got some good ones. Um, can yes, you I, I think, yeah, you so can you use all the right? cramps? I don't know what you mean by those, but I mean, the, these that I used were, I don't, I don't know the difference. Yeah, they were, they were, they were about so big, they were bright red. And actually, they weren't too tart, so I don't know, I don't know. Rhubarb chutney, fabulous, yeah. I did a, uh, I've done a rhubarb and, and courgette together, and that was delicious. And beetroot, we've actually got, um, we have got a, a, a food for life recipe for a beetroot chutney, so that's easy to pass that one on. Yeah, I'm gonna make a list and then come back to you guys. So we'll make sure we put everything up on the on the yeah on the on this on the website. Um, actually, I just want to make sure there's one. Um, there was one here before about using dehydrated fruit. Yeah. Is, have you guys have you ever done anything like that? I mean, I suppose you put. Um, I mean, you put. You can put prunes and dried plums and and sultanas and things in chutneys. Um, and like dried, I think I've seen recipes for dried apricot jam. So you just rehydrate them and then carry on as if it was fresh. Mm. Um, courgette, courgettes are um, we call them zucchini in the US, uh, but they're like a kind of squash. Um, yeah, zucchini make amazing bread. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. Um, which is just sitting. Here. Um, any advice for picking produce? Um, so yeah, the thing with pickling, so whatever you're pickling, and it could be like say onions, it could be, I did a whole mix of things with, I did cucumbers and some sweet corn and onions and chilies and things. You salt them beforehand. So salt them overnight. Um, and then you rinse that salt off the next day. So the salt is gonna draw some of the fluid out of the, the, the vegetables so that you reduce the water content content in them before it goes in with the vinegar, which again helps um, the keeping quality. But yeah, you, you, you rinse them off, um, dry them, and then you put them into a hot um, vinegar liquid, which can be slightly sweet if you want, which is really nice. So yeah, that's crunchy pickles, and that's how you make crunchy pickles, so that you get rid of a lot of the water and you keep it really nice and crunchy, yeah. And I, I can't answer the one about honey. I honey? have preserved with honey. I've seen recipes for fermented honey. But yeah, what was that preserving? I, I, I tried it and it didn't work for me. It went bad, but that was that was fermentation with honey. Um, I think it was something like cherries in fermented honey. Mm. Sounds nice though. <laughs> it would have, would have been if it had worked. I also tried that, making that banana vinegar where you just put banana skins in water and, and, and again, I think I probably got, I'm probably not clean enough in my house, but I think some bacteria must have put in there because it wasn't very nice. <laughs> but I used um, all these crazy ideas. I've got a really nice book here that this one's called Gifts from the Modern Larder. Um, and yeah, some of those crazier ideas are in that. Uh, I use that. Oh. Right, that down. Come closer to the, come closer to the, sorry, like it's just the sound that we need the. Uh, I'm, le I'm like leaning to my computer, if you can see my face. Um, keep, keep, come, maybe come a little closer or. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 that's good. Uh, you're talking about using honey to preserve. Yeah. I've used honey in cakes and various things like that. Um, my brother's used honey when he makes mead. But mm. I, I should imagine if you actually measured out the honey and it was the same proportion as the sugar, as long as you 
boil it very slowly, I have a feeling it might work. Mm. But you've not tried it. I haven't tried it, but it would be worth (laughs) trying. (laughs) Yeah. It it is. I remember the first time I made jam and I was, the the amount of sugar is crazy. Yeah. Um, Okay. I don't, yeah. I don't think you'd use the same quantity and, and you'd only have to try it with a very small amount of fruit. So somebody's yeah, saying yeah. there they love the idea of apple sauce and didn't know you could freeze it. Yeah, it freezes brilliantly. You can, you can bottle it, but that's a whole different technique. So you could make your apple sauce, put it in jars and seal them and then boil the jar in lots of, in a deep, pan lots of water so that you actually are sort of canning it so that way you've you've put your apple sauce in in a cold jar um you've sealed it up but then the boiling of it destroys any bacteria that might have been in there and then once it's sealed nothing else can get in um but yeah that's called that's called bottling um in this country what do they call it in the u.s they call it something else i think might call it bottling but yeah if you if you look at bottling you, you do apple sauce as, as bottles and it's how you might make your own tomato ketchup um you can make a sauce put it in a jar and then um, boil it and the amount of sugar in jam is it variable y- yes and the amount of water that you put in um it's all quite science You've got to get to a point where the percentage of the sugar is at a certain level that bacteria can't survive anymore. But that's why I'd say follow a recipe. Canning, yeah, that's what they call it in the, in the States. Yeah, I remember the thing. Um, we'll put, um, so the website, there's gonna be two places we're gonna put it on. So one, um, so we've got, um, so some of it will be going on to just the, the Food for Life website, which um, I'll email both of these out to everyone who's registered on the Eventbrite list um, at the end of this, um, well, possibly tomorrow. <laughs> but yeah, so I'll send those both out. But then we've also got, what we're trying to do is, I think with all of these sessions, what we find is that the most useful part about it is the question and answer and people being able to talk to each other and ask questions and get responses and all of that. Um, so we've got a new thing. <laughs> we've got a new thing that if you wanted to try that, that'd be grand. Um, and also an invite. So that will be also be on this email. Um, so, so it allows you to sort of access all the resources from all of the different sessions we've had, but it also allows you to ask questions and you can continue sort of getting getting support and, and answers after the session is over with. Um, so so um, I'll send out both of those things after I'll put the links out after the um, after the session. Uh, how many times can you reuse glass jars? That's a good one. I'd say um, uh, while they're still sound and not damaged, it's fine. Um, you can go on the uh, um, Food Standards Agency website as well and find out oh. about if you're selling produce and what the rulings are. Um, so you can use them. I would say you can't keep using the lids, though, because they then start to degrade with the high sort of acid and the sugar. Um, you could probably use them a couple of times. But the glass jars, so long as they're not cracked, they're not chipped, then you can you can carry on using those. Yeah. Inspect the lids, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do we have any other? I have one question. So what is the what is the weirdest thing you've ever made that w- was really nice for both of you guys? And then anyone else can chip in. Actually, for all of you. <laughs> Like what is the strangest combination or the? Well, I guess for me, not it's not that strange because it's delicious, but that that courgette and fennel blossom. I was yeah, marmalade. I wouldn't have expected that at all. Oh, is 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 just divine. I've probably got a jar in my a half eaten jar in my fridge. Yeah, half eaten jar in my fridge. Look, and it's yeah, it's just it's just divine. Um, and actually, to say who it came from in this book, she's got a little intro at the beginning of it and says she did um, a taste test with lots of different marmalades that she made, blind taste test, and everybody, not everybody, the majority of people preferred this marmalade. 
So, uh, so yeah, look it up. It's so Rachel de Thampel is is the um, the author of this. She works for River Cottage, and she's their fermentation queen. Um, and then the other person who's an absolute guru is um, Pam Corbin, Pam the Jam. Uh, you can follow her on Instagram and things like that. So I, that I do one. that I and get that. some great ideas. Yeah. Fun. Wales, what do you got? What do you got for us? Oh, the sound. You have to come right up, right next to the computer. It's not very exotic, but I found it. It's different from anything else I've ever done. Gooseberry jam. Cake gooseberry. Cake gooseberry. Oh, cake gooseberry. Oh, cake gooseberry. Ah, yeah. Fab. I mean, you can make pineapple jam. I've not made that, but I've seen recipes for that. Which all of these things, though, it's only if you can get them cheap. But if you're in a market and there's, you know, some cheap pineapples at the end of the day, um, that's the time to buy them. Well, with the cake gooseberries, we grew the cake gooseberries, so it was easy. Fab. To be able to use the fruit from that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's magic. That's magic. Jams um, and jams, yeah. Um, so I think there was one. There was another question about grape jam. Actually, I made jam with um. I'm from Arizona, and you can make it with cacti and um, with the with the fruits that grow on cacti. Um, called lunas, delicious. You can also put them in drinks and things. Um, but there was a question. I don't want to miss the question about. Uh, isn't there a question about grapes? Did I, oh yeah, grape. God, my internet's been really bad. Which is which is that? Um, I think the question was: um, Should the sugar be the same weight as the original grapes for the liquid after it's been strained? Yes. Sorry, Jane, you're on mute. I think you probably saw the shake of the head pass. It's not something I, I know. I've not done that, so I wouldn't know. I, I yeah, I make cake with grapes. Uh, and what I make is the same weight, the same liquid. It's a bit more kind of a grape juice, kind of a pint of grape juice, a pint of sugar. Sorry, the sound isn't very good there. Um, maybe if you could just type a reply into the chat and then we can, and then we'll have that there for that question. Thank you. I, I do think they vary. So the crab apple that I made this morning, you get your, your, your juice and it was, I had to use four fifths, four fifths of sugar to the liquid. So it wasn't equal. So I think it very much depends on the fruit and how much pectin's in it, how much sugar it. So I, I, I would really, yeah, I, I would look it up myself. Yeah. Um, right. So I think is if there's uh, I have one more. Um, I think we're sort of coming to an end. Um, So, um, yeah, so as I say, like, well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, we've got a really quick, it's like a, if you've done one of our surveys before, this is like a reduced version, it's much shorter. Um, uh, we've got just a really quick survey just to say kind of what, you, what you're gonna take away from this, what we can improve for next time. Um, you can mention the internet connection, but I don't know how much we can do about that, but I really apologize for the internet. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so if there's just, if I just put the link in the chat, um, if you could click on that, and that'd be grand, that'd be super helpful for us. Um, otherwise, I will be, so if, to be here, I'm sure you all have registered on Eventbrite, so I'll be sending out an email shortly with links to the to the internet, the websites, where you can find the recipes we've talked about here, where you can get the video. Um, super exciting if it did get translated into Spanish. Me gusta ya mucho. And um, yeah, I think that's it, unless there's... I'm super excited also to have other Americans on the call from 
home that's exciting too um that like never happens um yeah so thank you so much everyone um and yeah i'll just wrap it up there then i think unless there's any last questions or anyone wants to throw in their last like love their favorite jam or anything like that into the chat and um, but yeah, otherwise we'll like wrap it up and huge thanks to to groundware south, south wales and our and our brilliant crew and our movie stars um our movie star jam and chutney makers uh and to jane as well yeah I have so much to do with apple like I, I want this apple windfall all over again it'll be amazing um brilliant yeah so cheers thanks everyone thank you thank you I'm glad you enjoyed it and um, yeah lovely to see everybody so i'll say goodbye